door here? Yeah, this, um, yeah, this closed the door. All right, hi everyone. Welcome um, to this week's um, IRCEP um, topical meeting. Um, just to let you know, these are on a variety of topics. And in case you're interested, um, please subscribe to the mailing list. And also, we welcome suggestions of topics um, for these meetings. So if anyone has something they think would be interesting, um, please get in contact with us. Um, this week, um, we have Paul. Um, who's going to be telling us about the um, Common Tracking Software Project. One other thing, just to let you know, these are recorded, and they end up on YouTube. Um, we just wanted to let everyone know that that's what's done. All right. Okay, yes, thanks, Heather. Uh, we already introduced the, the uh, a bit wordy title <laughs> due to the acronym, um, but yeah. <laughs> so let's get going. A uh, quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. So I will very briefly introduce what we mean by track reconstruction. Uh, oh, just hold on one second, sorry. Could everyone mute who's not talking? I hear a bit of background noise. That's how it is then. Okay, I guess we're going to have... Room. No, I think someone connected and it started, but that's okay. We can manage. Okay, yeah. Um, so what it is, what John just... Uh, uh, we we're facing there. And then I will switch to talking about the ACTS project, what the basic principles and design goals are, uh, summarize in the project structure. And then I'm going to get a little bit more detailed uh, and talk about some of the components that we have, so namely the geometry description, um, the way that we do numerical integration, um, how we uh, are handling or intend to handle multiple events in flight, um, and then um, the, the common filter that we have at the moment for track fitting and its corresponding event data model. And then I'll finish with uh, short status and outlook. Okay, so what do we mean by track reconstruction? Uh, I'm assuming most people are aware of this, but uh, in principle, in high-energy physics, most of the time we refer to um, some form of dedicated detector system, usually silicon, and but sometimes also other components, um, where we um, sense when a when a charged particle um, passes through them, um, and uh, this. This, these particles produce hits on these sensitive surfaces, uh, and basically the whole point of track reconstruction is to re reconstruct the trajectories of the particles that actually cause these hits. And it can be roughly subdivided into three um, stages. Um, the first one is figuring out which of the um, combinations of these hits um, correspond to viable candidates to actually do the track reconstruction on. We call this seeding. Um, then is a stage where you try to find com additional compatible hits and then also figure out um, all the combinations that you want to take into account when looking for the actual trajectory. And then once you're happy with that, basically you go into a fitting stage where you then try to estimate what the actual parameters and, and properties of the trajectory are. Um, so yeah, this is basically what I just said. Um, so this, this multi-stage process, um, this pattern recognition to detect patterns and also reduce combinatorics, just from the fact that there's a lot of these hits at any given time. Um, then you want to do an exploration of the compatible measurements, and then in the end you want to do a precise fit to do, have a best uh, estimate of the trajectory. And then usually there's an additional step where you want to try to pick and choose between different solutions that might include, for instance, uh, the same uh, hits or measurements, or figure out a way to actually resolve uh, what we call ambiguities, um, and this is crucial for performance, especially in, in jets, for instance. Okay, so what are challenges in track reconstruction? I guess this is probably what everybody talks about in, in uh, these days. Is uh, yeah, this is very CPU intensive due to the fact not at least not at the very least due to the fact that uh, the combinatorics can become very very high. So you might want to, you might run into a lot of combinations there. And obviously, pilot also affects the performance in a significant way, because obviously the combinatorics um, increase uh, drastically if you increase the number of hits, which is exactly the case with higher pilot. And then looking at the, uh, at the pilot scenarios envisioned for the HLHC era and beyond, it's obvious that there needs to be some improvement here um, to cope with the requirements. Okay, so now I'm going to switch and talk about the ACTS project in particular. Um, so, in general, it's sort of the attempt to try and encapsulate um, concepts and lessons learned from the FS tracking software and make them in some way reusable and independent of the actual FS tracking software, but it's still based on it. So it got started basically as a copy-paste of, uh, of the source tree and then a cleanup and, uh, and, and, and detachment of basically the entire rest of the infrastructure. And the, 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 
foundational idea is sort of to enable R&D cycles that are quicker than if you have to go through all of the um, uh, connections and requirements in the Atlas software, and also to, um, for instance, to test threat safety concepts, which is due to, to the fact that it was kicked off at a time where Atlas was evaluating uh, if, how, and when to switch to, uh, to multi-threaded execution model for event processing. So you can see here that basically after this um, fraud, so to speak, uh, there was a lot of effort to basically just um, bring it to a state where it becomes usable on its own and where basically all the leftovers that we wanted to get rid of from the Atlas software were gone. Um, until now, contributions mostly come from Atlas people, but there is some involvement which is growing from other experiments uh, or experiment studies like uh, CEPC, BEL2, or FCCHH. Okay, so the basic design goals of the project are roughly uh, like this. The idea is that it becomes a toolbox of uh, experiment independent components, meaning that there's no uh, assumptions that are uh, um, inseparably linked to one specific type of experiment. Uh, and these tools are supposed to be relatively um, um, small and single purpose if possible, and, but they should allow building um, what we call applications, uh, which can then be experiment specific. And that will be something like a seeding setup, a track finding setup, a vertex finding setup, where you then can apply the tools that uh, are contained in the ACTS toolbox. Um, to facilitate that, we want to have minimal dependencies, meaning most prominently that there's no required root dependency. We have a root plugin, uh, if you care about that, but it's not something that you import by importing or by using ACTS. Um, one of the guiding principles is to minimize, uh, and if possible, to eliminate dynamic memory allocation, um, because it's one of the main drivers of performance degradation. And then also, like I said before, to be thread side out, thread side out of the box so that you can just use it um, without having, too much, having to put too much thought into it. Another thing that we want to limit and also ideally get rid of it completely, although that's very difficult, is a virtual inheritance because uh, especially in, um, in hot code paths where you call into functions or, or classes a lot, the virtual inheritance actually takes quite some time. And one solution here is to use concepts, with, which we're now just now starting to roll out um, a little bit more. And then the final thing is that it's um, rigorously tested. Uh, we try to have a high coverage of automated tests, and we run them in continuous integration to ensure they're followed and, and, and succeed. Um, OK, then I want to talk a little bit about the what we call the tool interface design, although this is not really um, this is not something that's uh, enforced in a very uh, strict way, but this is more sort of the, the school of thought that we have when trying to design these things. Um, and basically, we have three components here. Uh, one is constant configuration in the sense that you create the tool once and the configuration doesn't change. This is supposed to be given to the tool at construction as a configuration struct that, you, that is nested with the common name config under the tool. Um, then we have something uh, called options, which, for instance, if you have a method that takes a lot of parameters and the parameters are sophisticated on their own, we try to group them in one uh, struct so that uh, it becomes a little bit easier to think about them and to make, pass them around, for instance. And then the third thing is that we try to have, or we definitely don't want to have mutable members in any of these tools. Uh, and then in order to still have mutable state, we uh, explicitly pass in local threat local state um, variables as arguments. So in the code example here, basically on the left, you see a tool that does something. Um, and you can initialize it with a config um, struct like here. So in this main function, you basically create the config, pass it in, and then you, you instantiate the state here. This can be more complicated than an empty struct, obviously, but you pass it into the tool uh, in order to do something. And then, for instance, this tool can then accumulate, uh, I don't know, things that it wants to store or that it wants to keep track of in this state, and it's automatically thread safe. OK. Um, no Words to the project structure. So the primary thing that we have is what we call the core, which is the main library, and that's supposed to contain elements, and that's the one that doesn't assume anything about the event processing uh, framework that's used for, for an experiment. Then we have a, a separate um, repository or project, which we call the ACTS framework, and that's a very small Gabi Hive inspired event processing framework, which enables us to test event level parallelism um, without actually having to go into any actual experiments uh, framework. And that has a lot more, or has a, a few more assumptions on how things work. But we try 
relatively hard to basically keep that separate from the actual core component library. Um, and this has uh, some implementations for different geometry constructions. So there's a generic geometry for testing. We also have plugins to construct geometries from TGO, uh, from root or db4hep, and that's been used uh, in quite a few scenarios. And then finally, we have uh, the ACTS Fetris project, which is an ACTS-based path tracking simulation, and that can be used to create or simulate scenarios for testing and, and so on that are a little bit more realistic than just uh, particle gun uh, tests, for instance. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about uh, one for some of the components that we have in the, uh, in the ACTS project, and I'm going to start off with the uh, geometry and navigation. So basically, the way that the geometry works is one-to-one -one the same. That uh, Atlas has done it uh, for uh, quite a while now, which is basically that you separate the fully detailed geometry that's used for precise simulation, in, for instance, in GN4, um, and you produce from that a simplified geometry that's specific for, for tracking. We call that the tracking geometry. And this tracking geometry, as it is the case for Atlas, um, only contains uh, sensitive sensors that we really care about for our, as far as tracking is concerned, and then we group them into, uh, into different structures that facilitate navigation for us. So, for instance, individual sensors are grouped into layers, um, and uh, these layers are then binned to allow fast retrieval of compatible surfaces. Um, so you can look at this picture to sort of get a feeling for what that means. So just imagine you have a layer of silicon sensors here, and then we group them into this layer, which then uh, is by itself also uh, comprised of a number of surfaces, so rep what we call a representing surface in the middle here, but then we also have sort of uh, surrounding envelope surfaces um, that we call inner and outer approach surfaces that basically wrap the whole thing. Um, one thing that gets lost in this translation, if you don't take care of it, is the material of all the detailed geometry um, parts, basically. And to not lose them, because they're essential to actually describing the detector correctly, um, we uh, use a mapping approach, which basically projects the detailed material onto the simplified surfaces. So what, what we, you can do, for instance, so you can do it for basically any surface, but what you can do, for instance, you can project material that's inside this layer radius here, you can project it onto these inner, this inner surface here, and that means that when we actually navigate through the geometry, when we reach this layer, we can pick up all the material that the particle would have seen had we pro propagated it through the entire detailed geometry. Yeah, and this obviously scales from configurations like this to configurations that look like these disks on the left. Uh, basically, you can imagine that this is uh, relatively flexible. Okay. Um, yeah. Then in order to put many of these layers together, we group them into uh, volumes. And these volumes usually correspond to subsystems. For instance, in Atlas, that's the pixel and the STT detector. But in principle, the, the, the grouping is in principle arbitrary. Um, and between these volumes, um, you also want to navigate, because basically, in the, in the end, these volumes are sort of contained in one another and make up a hierarchy that leads to the top volume, which is your entire experiment. But the idea is to optimize the navigation for speed. And to, to do this, we try to pre-resolve as many transitions as possible. And what that means is that basically when we have multiple volumes, we try to figure out where or force them, if they're not big enough by enlarging them, where they actually um, have interfaces to other volumes. And then we create these boundary surfaces that basically tell us from which, vo from which volume we can get, get to which volume by going in which direction, basically. So this illustration shows it quite clearly, I think. So basically, if you exit the volume A to the right, you get into volume C, and then you can do this uh, successively, basically. Um, we call that gluing. Uh, and then that enables us to, in a lot of cases, skip, for instance, hierarchy searches to try to find the next volume, because we basically know what the next volume is going to be. And then inside these volumes, you then iterate through the layers that I described before by just assuming that basically you're going to hit them one after the other if you're going from one direction to the other, uh, well, from one point to the other. Okay, the next part I want to talk about is numerical integration, and uh, as is probably standard here, um, we're doing this using uh, the standard method of uh, Fungokuta integration of differential equations. So I will briefly make a little detour and uh, show you some of the history of the numerical integration uh, in, in Atlas, basically. So a long time ago, this was written as a complete uh, Fortran program. 
And it's, I think the complexity is probably hidden by these subroutine calls here a little bit, but I guess anyone who doesn't have a uh, thorough uh, background in Fortran and have, probably has a really hard time to figure out what the intricacies of this program are. So uh, I guess it's kind of obvious that this is not something that you want to keep around forever uh, if you have the, the option not to. Um, at some point, basically most of the code was ported over from Fortran into C++, but if you don't take care, you end up with code that, although it is C++, doesn't really look like idiomatic C++. So even though this is technically C++, still probably anyone who was not really super familiar with the actual program and implementation will have a hard time figuring out what the, what the, what the actual operations are that are going on here because they're written out component or element wise. So uh, yeah, you probably have to make fill quite a few papers to actually uh, make, write out what this does. But now when you compare it to sort of a modern approach to do these kinds of computations, so modern C++ and the eigenlinear algebra library that we're using, you can write out fairly sophisticated computations that are matrix multiplications and additions and so, for, so on and so forth as expressions like this, which almost resemble what you would write down on paper. Because basically all of the operations are abstracted into the operators. And if you look at this, you can clearly see that this is a Rulkosa integration. So this is not just uh, vanity because I think, or we think that more readable and more understandable code and it inevitably leads to, them, to, the, to it being more maintainable in the long run. Because someone coming back to this will, will have a much easier time actually figuring out what's happening. Okay, so structurally a few words on how the propagation works in Atlas. So basically it's grouped together under something that's called the extrapolator which is the main driver of the extrapolation atlas. Um, and it takes start parameters, uh, then does its thing and spits out destination parameters if you have a surface that you want to propagate to. Um, and it talks to several subcomponents that are called the propagator, navigator, and then something called material effects updater. And basically the propagator is responsible for doing the actual integration, while the navigator is responsible for resolving basically the path forward, what's coming next. Um, the propagator talks to this magnetic field uh, component there, which keeps track of the magnetic field and does interpolation and so on and so forth. And then there's something, an explicit component called this material effects updater, which takes care of um, the different types of material integration that you want to do possibly. Um, you have to keep in mind though that uh, this, these are all separate components that are being talked to through virtual interfaces meaning that there's lots of virtual method calls, and also the whole thing uses quite a lot of dynamic memory allocations. Um, yeah. Um, so basically this setup with all of the subcomponents used to be packaged in ACTS as uh, the extrapolation engine, just to have a baseline so that we can uh, iterate on top of this and make an implementation that we can directly compare to it. But uh, we have since removed it because basically after having done the validation, there's no use keeping it around and keeping it updated. Um, on the other side, we have uh, the way that the propagation works in ACTS. So if you look at, the, at, the, at the, um, the, the, the picture on the top, you see that basically the, the different components are still there. So we call the main driver of the propagation the propagator now because, yeah, it's a different name. Um, but the, 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 the fundamental difference here is that, that first of all, they're all template parameters, meaning that we can basically get rid of all of the virtual function calls, which gives you quite a decent speed up here. Uh, and then the other thing is that we baked in some, uh, an, an extensibility concept that we call uh, actors and aborters. So you still have these explicit slots for, for instance, the stepper, which is what drives the actual numerical integration. And that in turn has this magnetic field component with, which basically does the same thing as in the Atlas case. And on the other side, we still have the explicit navigator component because that you need in order to do any form of propagation. Otherwise it doesn't do anything. But we have optional components now. And the way this works is basically that you define a list of observers, so to speak, that can either um, modify or terminate the propagation. Um, and we're calling them basically at every step of the integration process. And that way you can, for instance, write something like a material actor that, um, for instance, changes the way that you, are, you handle multiple scattering uh, when, you, when you travel through a material. And you can, you can basically implement this as a plugin to the propagation uh, without actually explicitly having the propagation know that this is the thing that you want to do. So it's very extensible. Um, 
And on the other side, we have our um, basically main driver for the integration itself, which we call the, uh, the Eigen Stepper. That's basically the, the Ronald Kutter implementation using Eigen. That's why it's called that. And that in, in itself is uh, uh, it's even more extensible um, because there's different integration schemes. And in order to accommodate all of them without explicitly um, basically making the interface aware of all of these um, details, there's another extension mechanism which can actually change how the numerical integration in detail works while it's happening. Uh, and this is, we call this integration term extension. Okay, so basically enough with the structure, now a little bit about the benefits of this. So we have, like I said, we have this eigenstepper, which is the, basically the workhouse integrator. And then we have uh, something that we call the Atlas stepper, which is separate from what I said before, the extrapolation engine, in the sense that it's still the same math, but the infrastructure around it is already the changed one. Meaning that the only thing we're comparing if we compare the Eigen stepper to the Atlas stepper is the math implementation, which should be similar. And you can see in the plot on the right that the infrastructure changes already enable quite a significant speed up to what we had with this extrapolation engine before, while the Atlas stepper and Eigen stepper are roughly com compatible. Um, yeah, and this, this integration now includes the full co covariance transport, and we also include this step mechanism, which is basically um, a continuous integration mechanism for material effects and energy loss. Um, and we have that implemented in this eigen stepper. Um, but there's also the possibility to have alt alternative or specialized implementation uh, implementations, uh, for instance, the multi-stepper that I'm going to talk briefly about in a few more moments. Okay, uh, then another note that's related to the numeric integration is the actual magnetic field axis. So this is the Atlas magnetic field from the side. You can see the toroid here and uh, the solenoid in the middle. Uh, but it, I mean, I just wanted to put it here. It's not really important what it specifically looks like. <laughs> um, but the, the basic observation with magnetic field axis is that you query it quite a lot, especially if you have an adaptive uh, Ronokota step size estimate, uh, adaption, basically then you do a lot, a lot, a lot of iterations. And if you query the magnetic field every time to evaluate the differential equations, then yeah, this costs time. Um, but the, the, the fact is that the distance between subsequent queries is actually usually kind of small. So what you can do is you can leverage the fact that it's, the magnetic field is interpolated in these boxes in, 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 in a lot of cases to actually keep around this box here in the thread local cache keep it basically in memory, in, 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 the, in, the, in the fast memory caches uh, as much as possible, and then just lo locally interpolate between these uh, four corners. And this is also something that's been implemented at some point in Atlas, but it's not really used consistently and fully, but we now make full use of it in ACTS, and we can connect it basically to any upstream magnetic field source, such as the Atlas magnetic field in, in, in the end. Okay. Um, Another thing is timing information. So for instance, in the phase two upgrade uh, of, of the Atlas detector is going to be a high granularity timing detector that gives you the ability to, for instance, tag tracks with a time that you can then try to differentiate between uh, pileup uh, tracks and, and non-pileup tracks. And for that to work, you have to integrate your um, the timing into the numerical integration. Uh, and that works by just adding this to the, to, the, to, the, to the parameterization. So we did that here with this parameter T. Um, the data structures that we have in place naturally allow for this additional parameter. And then uh, Fabian implemented basically a transition to just always incorporate the time uh, integration. Uh, and we see actually in this plot here, you see the timing, basically the propagation distance versus how long it takes to get there. And you see in red that the, the propagation with timing, and you can see that it's actually slightly faster, <laughs> which is a little bit curious, and we haven't quite understood how that works yet, but it does. So uh, yeah, basically it's the timing propagation is fully integrated into the numerical integration now. Okay, uh, one other aspect is multiple events in flight. Um, so f as for instance, it's the case for, uh, for Atlas that um, event processing is going to move to uh, an execution model where you have multiple threads that operate in one process. And then you want to try to have uh, multiple events being processed on these threads at the same time. And, at the, and also you want to try to leverage memory reusage between these threads to keep the memory uh, footprint down. Um, this 
sort of becomes a little bit problematic when you consider the fact that some aspects of the detector uh, change over time. I mean, it's usually called uh, conditions, but it's things like the magnetic field temperature calibration uh, and specifically the alignment of the, of the components of the detector just change over time. And this becomes relatively non-trivial when you have multiple events in flight at the same time because you have to be able to communicate to every component what the current context actually is and what it's supposed to, to look at, basically. Um, so the example that I have here is, uh, is this alignment handling. So basically, the modules move. And in order to actually get the best, uh, the best tracking performance, you want to have very, very detailed information on the actual physical alignment of these detector modules. Um, how you get there and to, to, to derive the alignment is another story. But basically, accessing it um, when it's already there is, is, is what I'm talking about here. Uh, and the way this basically happens in the Atlas code for multiple threads right now is this. So uh, not at all. But there's a little bit more to the story than you can see in this uh, code block here. But basically, you're locking, and then there's a cache. And then you update the cache if it's not valid, and then you return the transform, which is obviously not perfectly ideal. On the other hand, what we try to use in ACTS, or what we successfully use in ACTS, is uh, an explicit context object. So we have three ones right now, one for the geometry, one for calibration, and one for the magnetic field. But the only one that we have thoroughly tested, uh, basically, is the geometry context. And the idea is to create it at the event level, so very infrequently, and then pass it down to where it's actually needed, where you can then skip retrieving the context every time, because you already have it where you need it. Uh, and then this looks something like this. So basically, the transform call, which gives you the position and, the, and rotation of the module, gets an explicit argument, which is this context. It's passed all the way to the call chain. And then basically, the lowest, the, the receiver of the call has, just has to unpack the transform. How that here works is not really the, the, the point of the issue. But basically, you don't have to do any retrieval from so somewhere outside of the scope of this function. Um, so that's lock free. You don't need any synchronization. And it's really flexible, because actually, you don't really care how this context is created or where it's actually created, as long as you get it correctly. Um, we want to extend this concept also to the magnetic field and calibration. Like I said, um, this is the infrastructure is in place already, but it's not really thoroughly tested. And then I have a few images showing the testing of this alignment handling. So in the lower left, you see basically a non-physical alignment or non, not real alignment scenario where I'm just pushing the detector in along one direction to just see that it actually moves, which works. And on the right, you can see the Atlas SCT detector, which is being aligned basically over the course of a run, or like where, where the alignment changes over the course of a run, uh, or multiple runs. Uh, but uh, for the image, I exaggerated the actual shifts between the modules a little bit so you can see something. But you can see that it moves. And that works for one thread. That works for as many threads as you throw in it. OK, so finally, I want to talk about track fitting and the uh, EDM that's associated to it. So first of all, Currently, we have one Kalman filter implementation that is in ACTS. And it's not entirely complete yet, but it's also already relatively functional. Um, it's implemented as one of these actors that I talked about before. So basically, it's, uh, it's run as part of the regular propagation. Um, and it gets automatically called during each step. And what it basically does is it just waits until it finds a measurement, and then it does something. Uh, and it can update the direction and uncertainties after the filtering, which is required in order to basically steer the propagation to where the measurements that you're encountering are pulling it. Um, yeah, and one, of the, one of the sort of major points here is also to try to minimize the heap allocation during this, uh, during this process. Um, so as far as runtime performance is concerned, which is obviously one of the most interesting aspects, there's no really apples to apples comparison at this point, because getting a test set up where you can make a fair comparison, for instance, to the Atlas Kalman filter is not really easy, because either you have to implement all the features to basically be on par and then compare the runtime, or you have to disable all the features that are in the Atlas uh, Kalman filter, which is quite sophisticated, in order to yeah, make something that's really comparable. On the other hand, we have the uh, study of the numerical performance by Shaosong, and you can see here that we are starting now to basically understand the Kalman filter better and better um, and what it does. And uh, this looks actually quite promising uh, and, and good. 
Okay, then the event data model that we're using for the Kalman filtering is something that where quite a lot of thought has been put into. Um, and uh, the basic assumption here is that the local sensor frame is always the same as the measurement frame. And that seems obvious, but it's not always the case if you don't actually take care to make this happen. Um, but if you do that, then basically when you convert to local coordinates on the surface, so like the co uh, parameterization here on the right, the local zero, local one, 2D coordinates on, for instance, this sensor here, then the measurement mapping function that you find in your standard Kalman filter mask uh, just becomes a projection matrix, which is nice because then you don't really have to make factor in any uh, complicated things yet. Um, yeah, the, the, the input to the Kalman filter itself is uh, done using something that we call uh, source links. That's supposed to be a lightweight object, which doesn't necessarily have to contain the actual measurement itself, but basically provides us with a way to turn it into a measurement. There's another component in the Kalman filter, which we call the calibrator. And that's um, basically the component that turns these individual source link objects into actual measurements that we can understand. How they look like the measurements I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, a key aspect of the calibrator is that it can be also context aware, and this is necessary because all these, um, these conditions information that are valid for a certain period of time and then might overlap or might be invalid again, um, they play a role in this calibration process. One example for this is, uh, for instance, um, wire zagging here. So if you have like a, a straw tube detector, um, the wires, you know, sag down. And the way this is, this can be done is by incorporating this conditions information, for instance, on the temperatures and, and other things, um, when turning it into an actual measurement that we then use for the, for the actual Kalman filtering process. Okay, so what do these measurements look like and what's so spe special about them? So the measurements are, know their dimensions at compile time. So that means that they cannot, can do fixed size math only. Um, the projector, which is this H matrix that I showed before, is then also known from the type of the measurement. Um, we, had then, but we then have a me mechanism to type erase these measurements so that you can, for instance, store them in a vector or something, and we do that by using a tag union. And then if you want to actually act on the concrete type, so let's say a one-dimensional measurement or a two-dimensional measurement, um, you dispatch on the actual concrete type at runtime. I'll show you what this looks like in a second. Um, but one thing, uh, yeah, one very good thing about these measurements is that you can also encode which parameters are actually in there. So you can say, oh, that's, this is the fifth component and this is the, the, the first component, and then this measurement class will take care of actually figuring out what the correct projection matrix is. And this happens basically automatically. Okay, and then this is a bit wordy, but you don't have to look at all the, like, all the details here, but basically this is how the, the dispatching works, because this is a tech union, you can just dispatch on the on the on this type erase type which is called calibrated here and then um, C++ will generate code for all scenarios and in, and, and in this generic lambda here you will then get as the, the the actual type of auto here you will get the concrete type meaning that this calib object you can just call methods on it and it will know for instance the dimensions it will know the projection matrix it will know how uh, how to calculate a residual here by doing the correct projections, picking the correct parameters, and, and basically doing all of this behind the scenes automatically for you. Okay. Yeah, then a few last words to the event model. Um, there's still some spots that are outside of this measurement thing where we're using some dynamic allocations. We want to reduce them still, um, ideally remove them. Um, then we're thinking about and looking into taking some inspiration from Atlas's XAOD um, model in the sense that the data storage there can be quite useful probably for a lot of scenarios that we're looking at. So that's column, column wise storage and collection um, based access methods basically. Uh, and then we're also currently looking into um, defining and, and replacing the, the, the underlying EDM for the Kalman filter, which is basically not the measurements itself, but the way that we, 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 we save them and we store them and keep them in memory. Um, and we are currently investigating if that's uh, a model that also scales to other types of fitters, uh, yeah, and, and, and possibly other execution environments. 
Okay, so this brings me to uh, status and outlook. Um, so basically what's there, we have this full propagation, we have a Kalman filter that's um, functional, um, we have a seed finder that can produce seeds and is usable, um, in addition to the geometry uh, setup. We have the time propagation implemented and tested, but so far most of the tests are relatively standalone, meaning they're in this framework or they're in a unit test, um, but there's a limited number of tests where we actually do um, do anything with, for instance, the Atlas uh, uh, setup. There are some tests with the Atlas geometry, so we have the ID, the inner detector um, built, and there's some tests for the kilometers and navigation through them. Um, and we also demonstrated the multi-threaded execution with, uh, with the lines um, detectors. So what's currently happening? Um, Jin is working on a multi-component propagation that we want to use for a Gaussian thumb filter. Uh, Bastian uh, is finishing up uh, the first round of components for vertex fitting, fitting finding. Um, there's some R&D into machine learning for vertex fitting, also by Bastian, and the MEQ to resolution by Nick. Uh, and we're currently in the process of performing the material mapping in Atlas using the rework mapping infrastructure that we also have in ACTS. And then finally, what's the plan for the basically coming months. Um, we want to improve and uh, better improve the, the test integration at, in Atlas. So right now the ICTS integration is sort of separate from everything else, but in the end we want to provide the same interface that's already there, but use ICTS under the hood. And we want to make a more thorough comparison between the Atlas comment filter and for instance the, uh, uh, no, the ACTS comment filter and for instance the Atlas comment filter to get a feeling for the, uh, for also for the runtime performance, but also um, Sort of an absolute feel for the for the for the numerical performance. Um, there's one uh, there's the idea to rewrite the navigation to make it more adaptable to to navigation approaches that are a little bit different from what our assumptions are, in the sense that it, it should become a little bit more pluggable because right now it's still relatively static. Um, we want to start working on the combinatorial common filter implementation because that's one critical component that's missing for to actually get the chain coming and um, going and to start at the last point, which is also that is that we want to get to a point where we can actually run some representation of a full track reconstruction chain. That's all I have, thanks. Great, um, thanks a lot, Paul. Um, any questions? And can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, um, so for the Atlas testing, um, may I know whether you work under Athena and yeah. How do you implement the uh, checking geometry for Atlas? Are you using TGM or DD4 hack? Uh, no, we're actually not doing that. So the way that it works is we basically parse the uh, the geomodel geometry. That's the Atlas specific, um, or in, in, by now it's actually um, also pulled out of Atlas. But that's the originally asked Atlas specific ge geometry modeling uh, library. And we're directly talking to the uh, to the upstream source for the Atlas geometry. So you have an interface talk to a uh, uh, GM4 geometry. And so the the source of truth for the geometry in Atlas is this geomodel geometry. We're building the GM4 geometry out of the geo geomodel geometry, just as we are building the tracking geometry also out of this one upstream source, the geomodel geometry. And there is no plugin for for. Uh, for GL4, however, it can be done. Yeah, sure. it's, uh, uh, all all one has to do is basically there's a single in this in this uh, um, the plot Paul has shown just shows the detailed geometry to the to the to the reconstruction geometry is you would have to identify the sensitive detector elements and represent them as a binding class and then say that's a surface and then the logic of sorting them and, and all of this, as long as you work with, let's say, standardly shaped detectors uh, should, should apply. So this is the idea that, that uh, yeah. this is the, the underlying one, idea. One thing, for instance, if you have a, G, a GN4 geometry, there's this GDML format, which can be read into a GGO geometry tree. And we have a plugin for the TGO geometry tree. However, what Andy said, basically parsing the geometry to actually find the, the components that you're interested in um, is still something that you have to implement because it 
it can't really happen automatically. So, to, and to add to the to what's uh, what's uh, available, that will not be part of the ACTS core, and not even at the ACTS framework. But we'll open a a new uh, repository quite soon because we have from this year's Google Summer of Codes project, uh, the, the the student had successfully implemented uh, now three solutions or four solutions. I forgot uh, how far it is from the Track ML challenge. Uh, to run directly uh, back, because the data set was produced also in ACTS with this FastSim uh, extension, to run directly as a module after, after this. So there's even the complete tracking uh, uh, solutions from, uh, from a few of those uh, uh, of, of contestants that's going to be available. And I think that's also quite nice and was one of the idea of the TrackML challenge to provide the code back to the community through such a challenge. Four questions? Hi, Paul. This is Simone. Um, okay. This is a very nice summary. I, I, I wanted to ask you on, uh, on Algebra 24, for instance. I didn't get uh, that. Sorry. 24. 24. Sorry, Simone. You're a little bit muffled, um, but we can sort of understand. OK. Let me, let, let's hope. Uh, oh, much better. Yeah. OK. I just moved the slightly the microphone. All right. Um, so here you've put um, time directory as, as in, a, in, in your representation. Now, um, the, what I was, I, I think I mentioned to you in, in the terms of like, if you think ahead of like um, experiments, like I don't know, LCB that may think of having uh, multiple time information along the trajectory, for instance, mm -hmm. right? And then I was wondering uh, how much discussion or thought you had on, on how to represent that, because when you have then multiple time information, uh, in some sense, um, then it becomes relevant if you have a non-relativistic particle, do you want to fit the velocity? And then it becomes more a parameter like it is Q over P, in which you fit sort of uh, the velocity of the particle instead of having a, in a single representation, you don't have that information at that point. Yeah. Or, uh, uh, or, or I don't know, how to, to handle those cases in this representation. Yeah, so the, there's two things I can say to that. The first thing is uh, the, the parameterization of the, of the location here, the, local per, the bound parameterization here, is in principle completely configurable. So if you, for instance, come up with the parameterization where you include the velocity or beta or something, then you can certainly go ahead and just do, use the, the same mechanism to store that instead of t. Um, however, the way that the, the propagation itself works is that it does time of flight, basically, to tell you what the time at the next propagation step is. So there, you have to then provide some form of uh, conversion in a function that you can implement, however, um, which will uh, basically extract this time and the time parameter in, in the units basically that the, that the propagation itself needs and then hand it to the propagation. Otherwise, you have to rewrite the propagation. Yeah. So, so, so far, exactly. We, so, so far, we have developed uh, the, the we could say integration and the transport of the, of the uh, time error uh, as time. Uh, and uh, I think for the moment, this is to my mind, I'm not sure if there's yet another uh, uh, product on the market that does a proper time propagation on the common fit with it fully attached. So, so for the moment we kept it like this. Uh, what I'm a little bit uh, reluctant in in uh, in uh, the velocity um, uh, the formal, for formulation is that you are practically making you start making a uh, particle hypothesis at that stage, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Because it, it, the point is that I think you have to assume uh, a relativistic particle when you do the propagation right now. If you propagate time on to another surface, you assume speed of light. Yeah, I'm, so I'm. I'm relatively sure, Simone, that uh, if 
it comes to the point that uh, that the, the time propagation is not sufficient uh, uh, for for a use case that we can do the this adoption as uh, as Paul said correctly uh, and make a co appropriate conversion pre integration step. But uh, I think probably a bit too much detail to discuss this in a in the Irish Head meeting with YouTube with a massive YouTube. A numerous YouTube audience. You never know, we might trend. <laughs> but it's a good point for someone to think about. More questions? Yeah, this is Paolo. I have a, what's probably a naive question on slide 24 indeed. Uh, so it, if I count in my head the number of transformations between local and global you have to do, it would seem to me that uh, if you had your measurement in global coordinates, you had one less transformation, but maybe I'm, do, I'm, I'm counting wrong. So why is it better to use the local sense of frame for your, for your measurement compared with the global one? So my understanding is that it's pretty hard to formulate the Kalman update in global coordinates because you have to constrain the update on the surface. Otherwise, you have all sorts of weird projection effects, I, I imagine. Plus, plus, Paolo, the, 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 if you ever thought about uh, the measurement surface to be a, an, ent an entity which is also governed by uh, conditions like an alignment, you have to correlate uh, those measurements together. And the, uh, so, so if you basically think of an ensemble of tracks that all go through the, through the, uh, uh, the same, uh, same surface, at, at the point you put that into the local surface frame, you basically correlate all those tracks together. Now, that works slightly also when you do that in global coordinates, but if you allow the carbon filter to, to, to uh, basically fit all three uh, global coordinates rather than two constraints to a surface, you lose this correlation. Besides, uh, we are talking mainly uh, one, two, uh, three, if you have a track segment, four dimensional projectors that are at compile time uh, 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 static sized known. Yeah, one caveat, they're not initialized at compile time. They're statically yeah, sized, sized, but they're not initialized at compile time because Eigen so far doesn't allow compile time initialization of, uh, of stack. Uh, matrices, but yeah. Yeah, but they, be, they may be compiled, but they're still uh, trigonometry, fa trigonometry, uh, trigonometry functions. <laughs> yeah, okay, I, un I understand the point, I understand the point of, uh, of the difficulty of losing, uh, let's say, the constraint of the surface. Yeah. yeah. Also, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't actually be, well, without looking into it, I wouldn't actually be sure that it's cheaper if you factor in the fact that you have to constrain it still. Right, because you also have to do some trigonometry to like, introduce the constraint to the measurement surface in global coordinates, because you have to parameterize the global coordinates. And for like for for the planar sensor, that's fine. As uh, soon as yeah. you run into something where it's nonlinear, then yeah. you're going to have a bad time, I think. Plus, of course, uh, the natural output of the actual detect uh, device is in local coordinates. So to transform this into global, you'd have to do one local to global anyway. Yeah, no, no, that's clear. That's clear. I mean, uh, conceptually, the Kalman filter is predicting a measurement, and the measurement is the local one. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking that you had to go back and forth twice if you went, to, if that's you stayed local. Okay. That's correct. Uh, yeah. Too much of a too much of a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. More questions? Okay, um, if there are no more, then I guess we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, but thanks everyone, and yeah, um, feel free to follow the mailing list to get um, more, more of these similar talks. Bye. Bye. Bye, thank you. Mm.